Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Podcast. We've got two special guests today. I don't often do um, bilateral interviews, I'd call them, but here we have a power duo. Um, last time we spoke and the energy really flows well between us three. So we have Judith Chervin with us. She's a PhD. We have Jim Snikowski, also a PhD. Both are co-founders at judithandjim.com. They're exec coaches for tech companies and both are best-selling authors. So welcome to the pods, to both of you. I'd like to have a brief intro and learn about individually uh, and uh, juntos, los dos, about what you do together. Charles, thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. And uh, Jim and I have been married to each other 35 years. And I want everyone on this podcast to know that there's no such thing as perfection. We met on a blind date during Jim's second divorce. Um, so he was already married twice before. And and I was in the final days of my second divorce. Wow. And I had never married and I was 43 years old. And we have been together 35, well, 36 years. And it was meant to be. So everyone who feels frustrated about dating or waiting or divorce, hang in, keep going. You'll meet the right one if you hang on long enough. Love it. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. Imperfection, I think it's it's part of us and especially us OCD CEOs. We always want to do our best and sometimes we get frustrated and lose important energy in the process of wanting to do everything right. But life is really messy, right? It's not this linear growth curve. It's more like a, a barbu, like we say in French. Um, I want to start with this. What do you folks feel is the the right, well, it's not the right start of a relationship. It's just that people mention, you know, it was um, the the shock from, from the, the get-go. It was like, it was meant to be. Is there such a thing or was the first part of the relationship quite rocky? Because Jim, if you were coming out of a divorce uh, maybe your heart wasn't ready to open up so how was the start of that and is there such a thing as a soulmate no soulmate ships is evolved between the two people you had to grow into that it's not automatic nothing in relationship is automatic you have to grow and give yourself to the coupling and make it happen and make sure that you announce what you believe is real, your goals, how you think your relationship should be. Most importantly, a relationship a relationship succeeds on the basis of knowing that the other person is not you. You don't take the other person as a reflection of you. They are beings in their own right. Due to have her own story. She was, she, she was a psychologist, practice therapist. She had her own practice. She had her own, what was it? Well, I had a private practice in Santa Monica full time. Uh, and, and yet we also had something very significant in common, which we met, which we talked about on our blind date, which was both of us had been professional actors earlier in our lives and we gave it up. And we talked on that first blind date about why did you give it up? Why did you give it up? And we came up with the phrase, the fear of being fabulous. And Judith had been in practice for about 10 years when I met her. She had her own money, which I did not, at least not by comparison. We had to deal with that. For me, it was not an issue to the cliche the man's the one who has the funds. I had to live with her knowing she was better at money than I was. She was better at business than I was. And therefore, I had to, I had to know that about this other person. If I want a relationship with her, I have to take her for who she actually is, not who I want her to be. Wow. And that's a complex thing to do because us humans, we project all the time and especially a CEO type of personally, personality like myself, I have everything planned. And it's more like, how can they fit into 
my plan, which it's, right. it's a very hard thing to do. You kind of need to dance with it, be very flexible, flow like water, Bruce Lee. Uh, first question I have for both of you, if you were actors, what are the pros and cons of actors? Because to me, trying to imitate someone's personality can be quite disturbing for the psyche. The brain can, I, it can confuse the brain, in my opinion. What do you think about that? Huh. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Me neither. I don't think it's about pretending to copy somebody else. It's letting yourself be that character. Um, I did mostly television. Jim did mostly stage. Um, I would say that both of us had fun doing it. Great fun. Right. And I was a method actor, meaning I lived the part. Okay. That, did, that did not in any way confuse me about who I was, but it allowed me to explore a different way of being in the world. So I guess you kind of need to communicate to yourself that, look, I'm acting, I'm playing now, because if you enact a psychopath, um, let's let's say like Johnny Depp and his characters, Johnny gets really, really deep in, in how he enacts his character. And doesn't that destabilize your life if you really live the life of a psychopath for like two months? No, no. It there are boundaries. <laughs> what tell us about boundaries because me i'm not that familiar with with those like in my entrepreneur life you know it's like this it's pretty much a, one line you know and everything's the same i'm the same charles throughout or, or similar charles throughout tell us about boundaries are you your company if i am my own company um yes my values are pretty much the same um, I am capitalistic as an individual as well. I believe in the power of, of money and doing good. And I I tend to be very much the same human, having the, the same value and being very honest uh, throughout my life. Yeah, which is rare, I guess. It's not the, the how most folks operate. Have you become psychotic? No. <laughs> yeah. so, so you know what we're talking about. And even if you're, as an actor, playing somebody who's crazy, you mm -hmm. you know that you are performing. Right. You know it's not who you are, you know? And what, and what we focus on, what Jim and I focus on now, is helping leaders in tech companies become more leadership, more leaderly, be stronger in their leadership, because so many people have what we call the fear of being fabulous. Um, and, and so that's why we talk about overcoming the fear of being fabulous. In the business world, is now known as the imposter syndrome. Yes, which is odd to see in CEOs, even myself, like very high confidence guy. Not so long ago, I interviewed someone on my podcast and became really nervous. You know, they were constantly resisting me and I wish I would play better with resistance and uh, objections uh, which sometimes you get right maybe once a day if I meet a, a bunch of folks how could I adapt myself better and and not because I think we venerate folks a lot like uh, let's say Tony Robbins which is one of my idols if I would speak to Tony I, I maybe I'd get a tad nervous you know how, how can I forget about this thing and, and stop projecting what is not to this reality and people. First of all, embrace it. And then pursue it, exploring it. Ask them why. What do they mean? If you don't understand, say so. I don't understand. Please help me understand. With Tony Robbins, I don't think you get very far because he, he's pretty bombastic about who he is. And I, I frankly don't believe him. <laughs> Interesting. And, and we, we would recommend, Charles, that anytime that you're feeling uncomfortable with a guest or somebody you're talking to, put it back on them. Yeah, right. We call it Sherlock Holmes. Ask them, are they nervous? Are they upset? Are they whatever you're feeling that they may be going through? Put it back on them. Don't take it on to you. And don't try to explain or describe them. Let them do it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, is that the Aristotle technique, Pl Plato technique, like asking questions, but Platonian technique, but 
Yeah, it, I was somewhat scared to do that on a podcast. What if you know, like it why, goes why, down a why, rabbit why, hole, why? it and it it I have to stop the the podcast altogether because it gets too awkward. But I guess that doesn't really exist in, in reality. That's it's only a scenario that control. I created. That's all in your control. And if may, you're going down a rabbit hole, you're you're going down the rabbit hole. And if your guest won't play with you. You don't have a podcast, really, so we might as well stop. Right. Right. I, I, I love this. And I think as humans, we're, we're somewhat good at, at creating self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Oh, if we think this negative stuff is going to happen, well, we project it so much in our mind and it takes so much space that it eventually happens. And same thing for the for the positive stuff. Um, I guess some people suffer about that quite a lot more than I do, but... I'm also surprised to hear that a lot of execs that you coach often suffer about that. What about their Why scenarios? Why are you surprised? Why are you surprised? Because they have such confidence and ego, um, most of them, and I won't call it megalomania, but when you're at the top, it's it's quite lonely, and you consider you tend to consider yourself better than others, or that is my guess at least. Well, you um, must to run the company. You must. Somebody has to be in charge. But that doesn't mean that they still, you know, that they don't have insecurities here and there about, for instance, one CEO that we worked with years ago was very concerned about why wasn't he happy? He had this, that, and so forth, but he still didn't feel happy. So that was where we had to work with him was what did he constitute being happy? Um, we have a client currently who is struggling with identity. Who, you know, who is she in this case? It's a she, um, even though she's pretty much at the top of her game, but as a mother, wife and business person, who is she? Because she's never been here before. And so we're helping her with identity. So there's a wide range of things that people run into as they become more and more successful. Is it accurate to say also that a bunch of CEOs race to the top because of their insecurities and their desire to prove others wrong? Um, I, I think more to prove, the, to prove to the world that they are right. I, I would not say that it's a rush to the top to prove that they're not wrong. I think this, if I scan across the CEOs we've known, it's that they know they're smart. They know they've had experiences that help their expertise and they want to stretch and exert influence. And in most cases, they're quite good at it. And they are not usually risk avoidant. They can make decisions which carries risk. They are they constitutionally can move forward on the basis of their decision making. They're not afraid of risk. You can't be in the business, particularly a high end, where a lot of money is involved. Do they suffer because of the backlash of these risks gone wrong? Although I think that CEOs are usually good at making decisions, do they accumulate? that pain of being wrong or the stress accompanying those decisions? No. I don't think so. Uh -uh. No, I think that they know. I'm just, again, scanning across the CEOs we've known. They know that they're not going to be right all the time. I mean, one of them said, I assume I'm wrong 15% of the time. What is the... RO, it's tough to put an ROI on working with a CEO, but is there, for example, would the board offer to pay you guys to work with their CEOs to generate more results? Or is it the CEO coming to you guys to fix personal stuff or both? CEO. I would say, and, and the board, we've never been hired by a board. Actually, have never even talked to a board. Right. <laughs> um it's that people reach out to us based on a referral. They've heard good things about how we work and we always work as a team. You get both of us. So partly we say you also get a good mom and a good dad.
that you may not have, never have had in real life. And in the immediate second opinion. Right. And do they see things unblocking in their businesses as well as a result? Right. Do they see more dollars after they, yes. they come? Yes. yes. Right. And what does it look like um, concretely? Like, let's say that I hire you guys. Uh, would it be uh, one meeting a month? What do we do in the first meeting? Give a, give me a portrait. It, it, it varies, but we start out uh, once a week for at least a month because we need to make the connection. We want to dig deep into the people, the person's background, and then typically go to every other week. And eventually once a month. Um, we are not interested in surface details. For example, we are PhDs in psychology, not in spreadsheets. We don't even know how to make a spreadsheet. That's not relevant to us. I want to know who you are and how you're doing and find out where your kinks and quirks are. Find out what scares you, what holds you back. It's not me that's at issue here. And where did it come from? So we often mm -hmm. ask clients, may we go fishing in your childhood? We've never had a single person say no. And then we hear what are the roots of some of these insecurities, some of these perfectionisms, um, where it came from in terms of childhood issues. And people are thrilled to have that opened up and revealed to them. We had a CEO ask us to deal with one of his VPs. He asked, uh, he said, the problem I'm facing with this VP, he's a little timid. I want him more in the game. When we found out about the guy's background, he had a military background, military father who insisted at dinner table that they had the correct answer and when they didn't, he frowned on them while the guy was carrying that load into his adult life. He didn't want to get involved. He was af unconsciously afraid of being criticized. Well, we helped when we, he, when we pinned that down, he was able to open up. With that much experience, do you get to know people even without asking them much question. For example, the data that you have on me for a brief conversation that we have together, can you estimate my character and who I am as a CEO? Well, one, you are far reaching and you have big ideas. Having to have big ideas itself is not risk diverse. You're not afraid of being made a fool of by your own choices. And yes, you have big ideas and you're willing. You said earlier on a conversation before we started recording, you're thinking about 20 years, 20 years. That's a big, long time. Most people can't even imagine 20 years. Yes, we give some sense of who you are. And we know you're an adventurer. You're living in Mexico. You're not born in Mexico. Um, so you're open to exploring all kinds of things, which is great. Yes, it is. Um, what problems could my type of personality cause to my ambitions? You know, having very broad goal, I'm a risk taker. I clash with non-entrepreneurial folks most of the time and kind of get impatient when things don't go my way. Am I in my own way with these behaviors and should I correct it, go with the flow? What would be the, the strategies here to improve my impact? Well, we would encourage you to make sure that your objectives are realistic. I would say my concern for you is that you're a big dreamer, which is wonderful, but you may get slapped in the face when your dreams don't fit with reality. And so that would be the biggest thing that I would encourage you to look at. If we were working together, we would ask you, give us an example when your dreams got put down by reality. Tell, tell us what happened there and how did you respond? We could go to explore that to see 
who you are in the crunch. So many times my, my dream got crushed, but I can remember of an example when I got refused to law school when I was younger and I had good grades at university. I even went in political science to to get my grades up and yeah, got refused. I can point also being refused by a girl at 16 or 15 and that really hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, I've got refused like so many times in my life that I think I grew this shell, you know? Uh, why, why did you not get accepted to law school? Yeah. Uh, because uh, it's what's the word? Well, there's a lot of people competing basically with better grades than I had, so uh, my 85% average wasn't enough, I guess. Did you pursue law school with other schools? Uh, no, and thank god I ended up in business and then I dropped out to uh, found my own businesses after going on an exchange student trip in Hong Kong, which changed my life. Ah, good for you! So you were also an adventurer that helped you change your own life? Yes. I founded like businesses with a partner during that time. And I discovered I could work from a distance in a totally different time zone. So really changed my life back then. So one of the things that you're exhibiting is that we would hope everybody on your podcast takes in is that you are willing to explore. So many people are not. Um, and that's what we call the fear of being fabulous, is that people restrict what they're willing to do in their life, and then they get stuck. Um, so we would really encourage people to explore more. Um, but you were not crushed. I Your 85% stopped you for a moment. But you did something that is really important in business. You, you deal with what's in front of you, make it whatever pivot you need to, and go forward. You keep going forward. You don't lay down. Because what's the alternative, right? It's depression and probably suicide when the machine stops, you know? Like how... Well, how... Even short of suicide or, right. or even short of depression is so many people live a very restricted life. And they accept it even though mm. it feels inadequate, it perhaps is even boring, not necessarily depression or suicide, but we would encourage people to be more exploratory like you have been. Um, and, and we have a program called Overcoming the Fear of Being Fabulous.com um, that we encourage people to use if they feel stuck to open them up. It's a wonderful audio workshop. What was your family like before the age of 10 uh -huh. for you? My my family, right? My yeah. th So dad's an entrepreneur, mom's a government worker, um, somewhat stressed uh, type, um, my, my mom, but I love her. And my dad, yeah, very the entrepreneurial type. I, I grew up listening to him making cold calls, uh, hearing him on, in his office and really abundant and generous type of person. So these these were my my parents i also have a brother um almost opposite personally personality of of mine you know calm uh collected reserved and non really not entrepreneurial <laughs> what does he do uh he is in auto uh, health and security he works for a company that uh, does health and security for garage um basically yeah would it sound perfect job for this person who's calm and collected? Yes. Um, good good for him. You know, I just had his, his uh, child and he loves gaming, my brother. Yeah, he recently gave up gaming because it was just taking too much of my time. And it was conditioning my brain in ways that I didn't like, you know, constant gamification and serotonin shots. But yeah, my background, my dad had a lot of impact on me. It's still weird to this day to think that I made the jump into entrepreneurship that quick. I had a first mentor that was really like a moonshot type of guy as well mm -hmm. that really helped um, me get into this. But I got in drastically and I I have never thought of getting a job since the past decade. Have you ever thanked your father for his influence on you? A lot. Yes. Um, oh, so yeah, worked on my, 
I never really let my EQ and I think it would be disastrous if I let my EQ go because I have good ego and good IQ as well. So I, uh, yeah, I worked on myself, tried to connect. I've, I've also had various coaches and psychotherapists. There's still some digging need to be done. It's never over. Um, and it resurfaces sometimes I've, I've been, uh, trying, you know, these, these ceremonies, um, I've been microdosing as well, which is really helpful for the brain really heals. Um, but yeah, the, the work is, is not over and I can see it through me being impatient sometimes, you know, with the, the wife, we have uh, doggies now that I'm taking care of like eight puppies and Whoa. eight. Eight yeah, puppies. eight. Yeah, and, uh, we have two, and one was pregnant, so she had eight. So that's eight plus two. And I'm realizing nowadays that I'm not. It's not not ready to be a father, but you know, I'm not the best version of myself, and I. That's why we decided to have these puppies, by the way, because we could have aborted them, right? But it's it's a good test, and I throw these on me just to see if I'm ready or not. And yeah, parenthood is seems to be this thing that. Well, I don't, I, I want to be the best version of myself for my children so that, you know, I don't do errors that will affect their, their future, I guess. Well, and you don't have to have children. I mean, that's not- I want not to have a, them. They're wonderful things. Okay. Well, that's a matter of opinion. We never have had children between us. I never wanted children. I don't like them around. They're already, they belong to someone else. I'm really a good stepfather. I don't want to live in for myself. Yeah, that and that's that's understandable. It's uh, it's like, yeah, do, do you like motorcycling? Well, no, that's not for me. Or do I drive a car? No, I'm dangerous behind the wheels. So it's, it's all about personal preferences. But yeah, children's, me, my fascination is uh, watching a young brain grow and I think I'm a, a good... Um, mentor or or coach um although i don't want to impose my stuff and i think that will be a challenge right i'm all about entrepreneurship and it's like yeah i want to teach my little one to sell lemonade uh <laughs> and make his own money and and be independent i'd also like to adopt eventually because i think there's too much humans on this planet earth a lot that don't have parents um maybe that can help the world who knows do not impose, live your life and, and if he asks questions, your child, explain to him what you do and show him by example so he can choose you. Well, and we have an invited granddaughter. So this is an example for everyone on your podcast. When she was about nine, she said that she wanted a couple of guinea pigs. You can only get guinea pigs in pairs. And while mom and dad have enough money, they said to her, well, all right, you're going to have to do some research, find out what it's going to cost you monthly to take care of these guinea pigs and put together a presentation for us. Like a deck. Like a deck. So she put it on a big piece of cardboard and she researched what it was going to cost to feed the guinea pigs, what it was going to cost to keep their cage clean. And they, the parents made it very clear that she was going to have to be in charge of feeding them and cleaning the cage. And she was fine with all of that. So by the time she made her presentation to us, she'd already done it two other times. And she saw that there were places, mom and dad pointed out, there were places that she not done her research. Um, and so she finally got her guinea pigs. And yes, she does chores in order to pay for the food and pay for the cleanup. Um, and these guinea pigs still exist. They, she still said, has them. But we were very impressed that her parents did not just say, okay, great, we're going to get you guinea pigs. No, no, no. You have to do your research. You have to know what you're signing up to take care of as as the owner of these guinea pigs. That's good, yeah. I did a nice post yesterday on the lemonade stand. So I did it like step by step plus the, it's a nice plan. I, I haven't put it in action, but uh, certainly I'll look it back in three to five years when I'll have my, my children's or more. Um, I have like two questions that I wanted to ask you because we're, we're kind of uh, short on time here, 10 minutes left. 
both of you have seen a lot in this world about human nature, um, about the various philosophies out there. If someone would come up to you, uh, an upcoming executive, an upcoming entrepreneur, and would ask you, like, what are your top three pieces of wisdom or lessons that are not common, not commonly said in this world, what would be your answer? The first thing I would say is make sure you are not competing with anyone else, that you are not comparing yourself with anyone else, that you are clear what your assets are independent of anyone else. What would That's you say? Good, Jim. Sorry, oh, all right. Second, I would encourage that person to not make money their number one objective but to make influence their number one objective. Who do they want to influence? How do they want to influence? What are they after in terms of influence? I would take that step internally. Make sure you are enjoying yourself and you are self-fulfilled. You believe in your objectives and your triumphs and you integrate them into your identity. Love it. And looking at both of your careers, do you have insatisfaction or are you mostly satisfied and happy with what, uh, what you did in the past decades? I would say we're both very pleased with what we've been doing as executive coaches and as, as authors, because Jim has written several novels. Um, People can go, can go to jamesnikowski.com. I'm assuming on your podcast, Jim's a spelling of his last name will be available. Yes. Um, jamesnikowski.com. People can see his novels there. And we've written any number of other books that the acting was the wise thing to not do for both of us. It would have, in a sense, been pointless, ultimately. Instead, we've been able to impact people's lives in a way that's been very fulfilling. The acting was really important to me as an initial step. I loved it. I loved it. I loved to moving an audience. At the same time, when the when the, that chapter was over, it wasn't a dead end. It was just a path that reached a conclusion. I saw it as a chapter being over. Now it's time for, to move in the next chapter. We have we have a phrase that we love to use, which is, when you get to the end, stop. Don't keep reaching. Don't keep clawing. It's over. Change the page. Go on to the next thing. How do you know it's over? Um, and is it like being at some kind of stubborn OCD type of person wanting to do too much? Uh, how do you know it's over? What a good question. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, other than I'm looking back on with regard to acting. I knew, yes, I could still do another acting part. I could still do another commercial and so forth. But so what? I was not willing to go after stardom. And without that kind of push, without that kind of drive, big deal. I'd been working since I was 12 years old. Um, like, what's next? What's next? And graduate school, getting my PhD in psychology was next. You have this obsession to really be number one. Um, stardom is like the parallel I could do here. And I'm not willing to let go ever of it. Really stubborn. Um, it. it the, then the, the question it begs the question why you know like what would be my it's not that I would be sad it's just that I feel very driven is it testosterone to to get to the top but I'm I'm not willing to let go and I, I view this as a some kind of perennial project that I will work on my whole life is that the right philosophy it's it's like the oh, Simon Simmons yes, yes, yes. okay yes it's like Absolutely. infinite game right why not All right <laughs> interesting and acting i mean i have good things to say about acting obviously you know the improv skill super useful as a ceo and an entrepreneur 
uh, the communication skills, the copywriting skills, the storytelling skills, and just the ability to see uh, the life of others, I guess, and try to understand the realities of the characters that you're playing. Would, would that be a good resume of it? Yes. Yes. Very I would much. agree. Last question for minutes. Uh, it always interested me and fascinated me, and I'm really impressed with uh, couples working together and building something legendary like both of, of you did. What are the tips for that? Is it the same at, as we started in the relationship? Do not impose your will on the other. How do you flow with your 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 relevant other part? I, I think to be clear what you are good at. I am the admin. I'm the administrative assistant for us. I am good at all. Really, the really good. At all of the technical details. Jim is far better at imagining and and seeing the future. So we're very clear that we have different roles in this relationship and we encourage couples to be clear what their roles are. Right, last question, what's next for both of you? What do you wanna accomplish in the next couple of years? Ah, we want to have one of our film scripts produced. Nice. That is our number one objective. And what would be the film about? Ah, it's called it's a romance. However, it's a romance set in a reincarnational context. They meet in 1505, they die and are reincarnated in 2005. They meet again, they had to figure out who they are, why they die the way they did. They lived during the time of the Catholic Inquisition. They were brutalized, they had to go back there through the help of world class hypnotists go back and find out what happened then in order to free themselves from them. So this reincarnational romance is what we're after, but we have other film scripts as well. That's most recent. But um, because we also have a, a romantic comedy um, about a romance novelist who's not married and she's desperate to find the right man. And of course, the right man is not at all what we would imagine she's going to end up with. And many of our formerly single female friends have cried when they read Mr. Perfect. Wow. And Jim, uh, one quick one for you and probably the last one. How do you get all these ideas? You know, are you me when I think I think in terms of image and my my brain can take me to wild places, especially right before I get to sleep. What's your process? I don't have a process that I can describe. You're saying, how do I get? I don't get, they're just there. And you and write I, down your ideas, I guess, or? When I, when I, sometimes, what I do to write a book, I don't plan it. I simply start it. And every sentence falls out of the one that precedes it. So it leads me to where it wants to go for 200 pages. Very nice. Uh, I think that's been a, quite a fun interview. Um, where can Thank people you, yes. find out more about both of you? At judithandjim.com or jamesnickowski.com. 